about flying with these guys and, and when I learned that they would be rehearsing here in Comox, British Columbia, which is just miles from where I grew up on Vancouver Island, I could hardly wait. Hi, sir. How are you? Of course. The one you guys are all on. How are things going? Shortly after landing, I met a legendary snowbird figure, Colonel George Miller. Good to see you. Like boss, George Miller, David Foster. Hi, George. I've heard a lot about you, David. Years ago, when he was one of the team's early leaders, Colonel Miller devised many of the amazing maneuvers the Snowbirds still perform. <laughs> Today, he's commander of the Canadian Armed Forces Base at Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, where the Snowbirds are headquartered. I would have liked to have had him describe his experiences, but in true military fashion, Colonel Miller preferred to talk about the present Snowbird leader. Twelve years ago, he told me, when Major D.F. Hugebert was the lead solo of a Snowbird team, his teammates called their star pilot Yogi. A nickname that stuck after he left the Snowbirds and resumed a distinguished flying career as an ace fighter pilot. You get under some runways, you get under tight Two years ago, Yogi realized a lifelong dream when he was selected to return to the Snowbirds as their team lead, and today the respect and affection he commands is captured in his new nickname. Yogi is still Yogi, a fire hydrant of a man with a big heart and even bigger sense of humor. But to the men he commands, Yogi has become the boss. 
I think uh, one has to have as a lead a lot of confidence. He has to be able to take and accept the responsibility of a lot of airplanes. Stand by, check it. Snowbirds, check in. Snowbirds, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, five. The lead ever to go on practice. The lead has to be that type of individual who can take continual pressure and still uh, be able to exude an image of uh, relaxation about it so that the team is relaxed and up for its performances and not uh, tense about it. When you get into flying like this, um, we talk about contracts an awful lot. What it is is uh, sheer honesty and uh, your ability to maneuver your airplane to exactly where you want it and not go into somebody else's airspace. To give you an example on a rejoin, we'll use the example of the two left wingers that are joining um, on me from uh, the left wing. Well, one's contract is not to go below my wing level, and that means he's got all of the airspace to my left and high. He will not ever, ever go below my wing line because the other fellow joining on that wing, his contract is not to go above it. And so his airspace for, for uh, safety is below my wing line and out to the left, and that's all of his airspace. Now, it's very easy to say, oh, yeah, that's a contract, but well, what happens if you go through it? Well, you don't. If that is a hard and firm contract, you can't uh, violate that contract. My contract is I won't hit the ground or I won't cause anybody else to hit the ground. And that's basically the big contract that I have. You have to trust them with your life. Just to, for instance, you may be at the top of a maneuver, upside down, and you can't allow yourself to be spooked by the ground. And there's where the trust is. I can't just all of a sudden break off and say, gee, I think we're too low and break off. Then I'm going to throw everyone out on my side of the formation. You just learn to trust his leading. You know that time after time again, he never lets you down. He never will. I trust him with my life. I have to. He's uh, the most professional pilot I think I've met in my career. If um, a bird hit my windshield and come crashing through and took my head off and my airplane hit the ground, yes, you'd have all of them hit the ground because they're looking only at my airplane or flying through the inner wingers onto me or some portion of my airplane. And uh, again, their contract uh, as formation pilots is 99.9% um, concentration is unacceptable. It has to be 100% in the formation. So something happened to me, yeah, probably, uh, probably be more than me would go in. Since 1931, when a group of crazy Canadians tied biplanes together with ropes to form the first aerobatic team, the Siskins, aerobatic teams have surprisingly compiled a safety record that is better than any other form of flying. But when the rare tragedies have occurred, they have most often resulted when leaders like Yogi have made a mistake. Several years ago, an entire Dutch flying team was wiped out when they followed their leader into a Swiss mountainside. And in 1979, the leader of the American military team, the Thunderbirds, miscalculated during a routine maneuver and crashed into the Nevada desert, killing himself and three other teammates who followed him into the ground. I'm scared of heights. I'm sc I can't go to a, a balcony and look over the side of a balcony. I'll get dizzy. I can't do that. I can be in an airplane upside down. It won't bother me because I'm strapped in. I think it's what it is. But... Uh, to look over a balcony, it'll actually make my head spin. I fly an inner slot and I fly the inner right wing. But directly behind me, he's probably about six feet below my tail. And on either side, we're looking at probably uh, four feet of uh, overlap. Overlap means directly behind each other like this. And then there would be four feet, four feet of overlap this way uh, with our wings. That's how I'm sitting on the uh, boss's aircraft, about four to six feet inside of his wingtip, and so will somebody on mine. I'm allowed about six inches to a foot high, and uh, probably six inches to a foot low, and about a foot laterally, and that's my contract. That's my what we call an aero box. 
That's where I'm allowed to make my errors inside of that box. I'm allowed to shift around in that box. I'm not allowed to move outside of it. It's probably the most exciting thing I've ever done. I probably ever will do. It's the best job. I know right now it's the best job I'll ever have. You enjoy the uh, celebrity status of probably some performers. Uh, you enjoy the rush of maybe Olympic athletes and in what they do and what they're able to perform. So for two years you're a hero, and I think that's where the advantage is. is uh, we know that it's two years long, and then it's over. Whereas other people may sit there and say, well, maybe I'll make a comeback one year. I know that in two years I'm, I'm finished, and I'll be glad when it's over. But I'm having the time of my life right now that I'm doing it. If anybody seemed destined from birth to become an ace fighter pilot, a real-life top gun, and a snowbird solo, it would have to be Don Broder. After all, Don's grandfather was the legendary Roy Brown, who earned a place in the history books as the man who shot down the Red Baron. But though Don grew up in the Air Force as the son of another distinguished pilot, it was not until his older sister married an American Air Force pilot that Don began to feel his flying genes. His brother-in-law would subsequently die in a crash, but that tragedy only reinforced Don's determination to someday become a Top Gun himself. If there were never, ever accidents and never any fatalities, the type of people who fly fighters and fly jets would not be the same type of people that they are today. As to the explanation of why an accident would cause me to go and make a decision like that, you'll, uh, you'll have to find Sigmund to answer that question. Even psychiatrists like Sigmund Freud might have difficulty understanding why grown men want to play chicken. But that's seemingly what a snowbird solo performance amounts to. Let's compare it to two cars coming down a wide open area, no, a road with no lines on it. You've just got to line yourself up with that guy. He's going 60 miles an hour, you're going 60 miles an hour, you're head on. 60 miles an hour is about 88 feet per second. So with no lines, run at the guy and get yourself to go, let's say, three feet by his door. Do the same thing, add in the up-down, and instead of 88 feet per second, each of you is going 450 feet per second, so about uh, 900, feet, 900 to 1,000 feet per second closing. If I do make an error, it could be critical, and I know where the seriousness is you know, at that point, and uh, I try not to make those, uh, those particular mistakes. It's never out of my mind. It's in the back of my mind. Uh, it's got nothing to do with the fact that I've got a lot of life insurance on me, but... Uh... You can make lots of errors, and every show is a myriad of errors, but you can't afford mistakes. So if you set up in the wrong place, you better realize that at least 2,000 feet back, that gives you a second to react, a second to make the correction. What we do when we turn into show line, we look at each other. I will call smoke on, which is of course the smoke that we trail. And then when I see him, I will call a contact, contact. which means I can physically see contact. him. And he responds only when he sees me with another contact call. After that, I don't look at him. I've got my job to do, he has his job to do. His job is to miss me, which is why I have that faith in him. I don't look at him anymore. I know he's not gonna hit me. If he did, he'd be fired. In fact, he told me one day, he said, you won't have to fire me, I'd quit. <laughs> Despite their relaxed demeanor on the ground and, and uh, their attitudes, which seem so casual, when they climb inside an aircraft, it's deadly serious. It's a very, very unforgiving business. 
I'll never forget that brush with death. And like most of us, I wondered how the snowbirds dealt with that prospect on a daily basis. I've had a few close, close calls. Uh, I think all the uh, all the men on the team have uh, things that I guess you uh, skip a heartbeat, have a gray hair or two grow out of this situation. Perhaps the closest call I may have had was uh, I had a windshield that started to disintegrate on me. I brought the airplane back before it actually did let go. It uh, was kind of worrisome at the time, but it was all safe and sound. Well, how did you feel after? I think just thought of it's another day of flying actually <laughs> it is stressful uh, stressful in that uh, obviously you're very close to each other and uh, a one second distraction could cause uh, an accident to take place we can never relax or say well I've seen it all I've done it all because uh, if you have a cavalier attitude towards flying this is probably when something will well grab you, catch you, and, and, and leave you out, basically. After doing the same show for two years, uh, you might be lulled into a, a false sense of security, thinking that there's uh, there's virtually nothing you can't do, or, or there's no way you can get into trouble, I and mean, that's exactly what you don't need when you're flying as close as we do. Um, it doesn't hurt to get scared, and I, get, I normally get scared about once a week. And that keeps you honest. You know, it, it stops you from being, uh, from your head swelling or, or being complacent. I never, honestly, th honestly, I never think about it while I'm in the air. I'm too busy trying to do my job. In on the ground time, sometimes you consider it. I'd say as you get older, you consider it more. But the benefits that I get from flying far outweigh any of the possible risk factors. They've been calling him Hillbilly ever since he was a Toronto teenager addicted to motorcycle racing. But as thrilling as they were, the machine Steve Hill loved only provided him with a two-dimensional ride. So, after studying aircraft mechanics at college, Hillbilly joined the military and he put up with the discipline and the haircuts simply so he could fly in a three-dimensional fast lane. wanted to do it for a long time uh, and to finally get the chance to do it, it it's uh, it's like sort of a thrill of a lifetime every day you get in the airplane for that brief period of time while you're in control of the airplane and airborne it's, it's very hard to distinguish between yourself and the machine you seem to be operating like one thing going through the air It's almost like the airplane isn't there, that it's, that it's you that are there, and uh, you're just doing whatever it takes to keep yourself there, and you don't really think of it as flying, and it's a really neat feeling when, it, when you get to that point. Flying has always given Steve Curtin a special feeling, and in fact, he still likes to fly the radio-controlled model planes he started on as a kid. Since then, the Hamilton native has literally flown everything and anything from a single-engine Cessna to a jet fighter. But there is, surprisingly, one form of flying that has prepared him best for his position as a snowbird inner winger. Flying a helicopter for uh, five years, I've kind of gone into the smoothness of flying. I don't, uh, I don't like yanking and banking the airplane around. For my job would be to maintain a very smooth platform for the other guy to fly off of. Uh, it's sort of been described as if you have a game crack the whip or something. If lead hits a bump, high hit a bump, by the time that translates to my wingman, he's gone. So I have to try and be as smooth as I can to give him a really good ride. From the ground, a snowbird performance looks so effortless, so easy. But up in the air, the pilots are really working. Not only are they manhandling an 8,000-pound aircraft, but they are often fighting the Gs, which is pilot shorthand for gravitational forces. Positive Gs increase the weight of an arm or a leg by as much as seven times its normal weight, while negative Gs cause blood to rush into the head, blurring the vision so that everything becomes a pink haze. 
Gravitational forces can even cause a pilot to black out, and to combat that grim possibility, Snowbird pilots are constantly performing a series of what amounts to isometric exercises to keep the painful and dangerous effects of the G's within safe limits. Rolling up. It's really busy up there. There's a lot of things happening. Rolling. Your eyes are constantly changing, looking at different things. Uh, your mind is uh, thinking about what's coming up next. You're listening, what's happening on the radios, and you're coordinating it all with your feet and your hands. Somebody did a study on us one time a few years ago and, and they figured that the energy expended in a snowbird performance equated to an eight hour day at hard labor. So when we do two shows a day, it's no wonder the individuals are tired. Everybody has a good show on the wave taxiing back in. Uh, there'll be nothing but chatter on, the, on our frequency. There'll be jokes flying, uh, people laughing, kibitzing back and forth. If the show has gone badly, you're trying to put it out of your mind so that you can think of the things to correct for the next show. You always want to be a little better every trip that you do because you always learn something new every time. And, and the fun that I get is uh, my own reward, I guess, at the end of the trip, knowing that I've done my job right or wrong. To be a snowbird, it seems like your hands have to be reflex extensions of your eyes. And probably nobody requires that natural gift more than Captain Jim Follow. Jim's teammates sometimes call him new. But when you fly right in the middle of a tight snowbird formation, it's no joke being surrounded by other planes just inches away. In those situations, Jim's hands have to be as steady as the rock of his native Newfoundland. In snowbirds, uh, obviously you've got to be capable of flying your aircraft properly and accurately and very well. But on the other hand, you can't be an individual if you're stuck in the middle of a, a nine-plane formation. The right stuff is, is not really a term that I like to use, but... Uh, I would say more uh, professionalism and uh, in, our, in our specific job, teamwork as well.
At the end of the week I had spent with the snowbirds, I realized that the truth about pilots is far more interesting and even more inspiring than what Hollywood would have us think. The snowbirds, it turned out, weren't the supermen of movies, but instead they were ordinary guys who, through a combination of hard work, skill, intestinal fortitude, and grace under pressure, are able to do extraordinary feats extraordinarily well. And that, it seems to me, is what the real stuff is all about. The capacity of ordinary people to do the extraordinary. There you go. Well, it's split now. <laughs>